purposes of fraud and residential conveyancing, simple steps you can take to mitigate risk for your client and your firm. Uh, my name is Stephen Smith, and I'm joined once again by the wonderful Ian Quayle and Robert Kelly. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> you were suggesting just uh, before we came out there that the, uh, the weather has completely turned where you are. It's a bit grim, uh, but uh, at least that saves any sort of activity in the garden later today. So uh, I'm, I've, uh, I'm excused gardening duties, Stephen. So that's a bit of good news. And uh, indeed, sure I must, I must admit, it's been said before, but uh, gardens around my area have never looked so pristine actually in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay. Um, before I pass over to you, Ian, um, I'll just briefly go through a few housekeeping points for everyone. Uh, I think everyone's more or less aware of these by now, so I'll just race through. Um, you're listening through your computer audio system by default. Um, if you'd like to switch over by telephone, you just click the telephone button uh, and the details of how to uh, log on through the telephone will be uh, displayed below that. Uh, you will have the opportunity, as always, to submit text questions to Ian uh, by typing your questions into the questions pane of your control panel. Uh, you can send the questions in at any point. Um, but we will have a designated Q&A uh, session at the end of today's presentation. You can also raise your hand at any point, whether you're having some uh, IT issues, technical or sound issues, and I can try and help with that. Um, and also, if you would actually like to speak to Ian directly and would like to raise your hand to do that, we can discuss that and put you uh, on mute your system as well. Uh, once again, we have added uh, the notes to today's uh, session. Um, so that's under your, your handout section of your control panel. Um, we've also um, added the fraud solution policy, the sample of, of that that uh, Stuart Title offer. Um, we're not so much about the hard sell on these, uh, the webinars, uh, they're very much an educational thing, but we have had many of you ask about policies in previous weeks related to the topics we've spoken about. So we felt that for those that you're interested, uh, it is there if you wish to download it. Just very briefly, uh, the policy covers the purchaser and the lender in the event that prior to the policy date there has been fraud, forgery, duress, incapacity or impersonation of the paper title owner by a third party who purports to have a legal estate uh, in the property. Um, just of note, the average house price in the UK is currently around £230,000 um, and the premium for the policy at that level is around £22.40, which is inclusive of IPT. Uh, in order to access these handouts, it depends what platform you have logged on with, but it should be quite straightforward. You should be able to just click on the name of the, the handout. It will either then open automatically or download. Uh, and from the download, which should be on the bottom left-hand side of your screen, you can then choose to open or, or save the, the handout. For those of you that uh, don't download any of this or miss this and are still interested, we will be following up in the next day or two and we will include all of the materials. You also notice actually in the chat function, I've also put a link to a, a YouTube channel where we're storing the, the recordings of the videos so far. So if you have in, any interest in looking back at any of the recordings we've had so far, you can do so by clicking on that link. Finally, uh, at the end, we will be running a couple of polls um mainly just to see how uh, your feedback a bit on the uh the webinars uh and how we can uh, not necessarily improve them going forward but how often we do them and the sort of topics you might be interested in anyway I've, uh, as per usual talked about far too long so um ian i'll pass over to you for the main part of the presentation today thank you thank you stephen thank you good morning everyone it's uh, it's like sort of uh, resuming contact with friends on a wednesday now it's quite remarkable a, a few points really just before we embark on, on the notes firstly uh stephen robert and i were speaking about you know, delivery of the course etc and i'm anxious that uh, we stay ahead of the game with regard to content and timing etc so the polls that uh, stephen will be putting out towards the end of the webinar are very important in addition to that, I'm very grateful for questions that people are generating. Uh, one, because it means I've got an excuse for not going in the garden. And two, lots, lots, in fact all, to be fair, generate issues uh, that require me to do a little bit of thinking, enable me to go and do a bit of investigation. 
etc., and enable me to sort of uh, investigate issues that perhaps I haven't thought about in the past. So, one, there's no such thing as a stupid question ever, and two, do fire away with regard to questions or queries. Sometimes it takes me quite a while to get back to you, and I apologise for that, but I am busy. And uh, sometimes, you know, I am stumped with regard to an answer where all I can do is sort of endorse what you're saying or suggest that your sort of uh, supposition is correct. But uh, certainly do feel free to use that facility. And then finally, of course, Stuart Title are very kind in connection with sponsoring these events and also showing a willingness to develop the events for the future if there's demand for it. So uh, that's great. And thank you very much. Property fraud. Important issues with regard to fraud. The first thing that I want to mention to you is we don't really know at the moment what the sort of current fraud and fraud levels are. What we tend to see uh, with regard to fraud is when frauds are discovered. And they can be discovered due to alert systems such as the land registry, such as solicitors sort of spotting issues or problems, uh, or they can sort of uh, result from either SRA activity or negligence claims against firms of lawyers. So I think the important thing is, you know, when we talk about fraud today, we're really talking about historical fraud that we're aware of. Uh, what the current fraud is, who knows? What the current clever frauds there is up to, again, who knows? We'll only find out as and when they're found out, as it were. So I think that's an imp important point. What I'm going to be doing is looking at uh, what sort of fraud has caused problems in the past, where there is the potential for liability, and that's pretty scary, to be honest with you, and just sort of heightening awareness relating to what we can do relating to fraud. Um, interestingly, looking at statistics, it seems that 2015, 2016 were the sort of the real period when sort of seller identity fraud was a sort of major issue, a major issue. It still is an issue, as we'll see a little later, but at that time there was a sort of a hotbed of seller ID fraud. And to an extent, that fraud has declined year on year since then. And the only reason I suppose it's declined is because of awareness and because fraudsters have moved on to, to different things. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is, with regard to fraud, what types of fraud are being encountered? Well, in my introduction to the notes, I talk about a number of different frauds. The impersonation fraud, registered proprietors, unregistered owners, buyers, sellers, borrowers, lenders or conveyances. Lots and lots of facility, lots and lots of availability for impersonation. <clears throat> Three things that I have sort of noticed over the years relating to impersonation. One, just how easy it is, given computers and software, to generate documents and for fraudsters to be able to ge generate documents. To an extent, the web is a fantastic facility, but it's also a fraudsters charter, isn't it, if you think about it? If I were to look at any one of your firm's websites today, my guess is that I would be able to see your firm's logo, I would be able to identify who the partners in the firm are, who the fee owners in the firm are, and therefore I have an opportunity for impersonation if that's what I wish. As far as passports, utility bills, etc., are, cons are concerned, again, most computer systems, most scanning systems will enable uh, documents to be scanned and or modified with relative ease. And therefore, to an extent, we're fighting a losing battle with regard to sort of physical ID, physical documentation to support ID. And unfortunately, we're not sophisticated enough as yet to be able to look at IT to help us relating to identity. We're getting there. There are some small stops, uh, steps being taken, government gateway, land registry investigations, etc. cetera. Some, uh, some systems out there that can assist us with regard to verification of ID. But I think the first point I want to make is it'd be very dangerous just to rely on one system and one process. So the first thing I would say with regard to attempting to defeat impersonation, we should be looking at duality of information. In other words, if we're doing some form of electronic verification uh, system relating to a client, then there should be some form of secondary system to back that up. 
if we're relying on documentation from our clients and the production of physical documentation, perhaps there should be some form of secondary system that we're using. Electronic verification might be the answer to that. Uh, the thing that worries me is that at some stage in two years, three years, four years, five years, six years time, someone might come along with regard to an issue or a problem and we will be judged by the sort of sophistication of, of, of that time and the systems of that time, even though the court would be looking at what a reasonable conveyancer would do in 2020. There is this sort of implied um, sort of um, idea that uh, insurers, the courts, the judiciary might say, well, hang on a minute, you know, what you did there was entirely unsatisfactory. Where we've got this sort of state of flux, where we've got this situation where we're not quite sure what we do, then uh, th there's a danger in how we are judged at a later date. So we've got to be careful about that. Other types of sort of uh, fraud that you may not have encountered, may not have thought about, the use of unilateral notices. Um, the Land Registry told me about this, that they were concerned about unilateral notices being placed on a title without any substance or justification in an effort to extract money from registered proprietors. So I place a unilateral notice on your title alleging X, Y, or Z, some form of estoppel, some form of boundary issue, etc., and I'm only willing to remove it if you are uh, willing to pay me some money, a sort of nuisance factor. That's why with unilateral notices that are uh, applied for at the land registry, by the lay client, the land registry will insist on documentary evidence being submitted in support. Other sort of more subtle fraud, the sort of invented boundary dispute, have you heard of this one? Where a client contacts you and says, I'm in dispute with a neighbor and produces a copy of the official copies of the register, forged forge passport, utility bills, etc., to verify ID. And then uh, there is a sort of fictitious neighbor where exactly the same situation has arisen and a fictitious boundary dispute is created. So in essence, two firms of solicitors are involved in correspondence with regard to this imaginary boundary dispute, culminating in one of the clients paying in to client account a sum of money in order to settle the claim. And in essence, what they're doing is washing uh, illegal money uh, uh, into, from one client account into another client account and then disappearing off into the ether, sort of legitimizing that funds. I was astounded when I heard about that, but I've seen it on two occasions, so just be aware of that, of course. I mentioned in the notes uh, lenders being defrauded by the submission of forged discharges. Again, highly unlikely to happen now with regard to electronic discharge, etc. Just be aware of it. Uh, solicitors being provided with discharge documents by the registered proprietor and then removing the charge and the discharge proving to be fraudulent. There's been a case in 2016 that I mentioned uh, involving the chief land registrar and Caffrey and Company, which is 2016. Company fraud. Um, again, the land registry has switched on to this, but companies house aren't. If a company is dissolved at company's house today, there's nothing to stop me registering a new company under the same name as the company that's just been dissolved. Now, I may be able to check, well, I will be able to check at company, uh, so the land registry, whether that company owns any land or property. And if it does, then I may be able to impersonate the old dissolved company, courtesy of the new company that I've just created. Of course, the company numbers are going to be different, but... I have seen situations where lawyers didn't check the relevant company numbers. I have seen, particularly with regard to freehold reversions on black blocks of flats, where there's been a dissolved reversioner that a new company is created and then sort of steps into the shoes of the old company. And what they do, which is quite cute and quite clever, is they, they read, write to leaseholders and say, uh, you haven't heard from us for a while. The company's had financial difficulties. We've refinanced, we've changed addresses, we've changed personnel but we're now going to take over the management of this particular block. Invariably, what they normally start with is you haven't paid your ground rent for the last sort of five or six years. We need that money from you. You haven't paid the service charge for the last three or four years. We need that money from you too. And then straight away, you sometimes see leaseholders are so delighted that the management could be sort of woken up and is now going to take their responsibility related to management seriously that they pay the money over. And uh, 
the fraudster in that context, the company fraudster in that context, then becomes a sort of perfect landlord and isn't investigated or identified. Um, there is a sort of a twist to that in that you sometimes see that company phoenix type of fraud and then the frauds the company attempting to sell an asset. The land registry has switched on to that and uh, will normally challenge or ask the Treasury solicitors to confirm the position with regard to the old dissolved company. Before I sort of delve into notes in detail, I mentioned two examples revealing the spectrum of fraud. And first, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, about uh, a solicitor in Leicestershire, uh, in Loughborough, in fact, that uh, attempted to uh, sell fraudulently three properties. One of the properties was successfully sold. The other two were not successfully sold on the basis that solicitors dealing with the other side of the transaction spotted that there was a problem or issue. So we've got that sort of fairly unsophisticated uh, professional fraud uh, relating to uh, a dishonest solicitor attempting to defraud uh, property owners. But then you've also got at the other end of the spectrum a solicitor being fined £24,000 by the SRA in connection with a failure to verify identity of co-owners, where there was a fraud committed by one co-owner against another. Uh, we haven't spoken a lot about co-ownership other than when we talked about land registration. Co-ownership is an interesting topic that I, I like to speak about because it's a happy hunting ground for claims and complaints by clients. But in this particular case, uh, the SRA emphasised and the Solicitor's Disagreement Tribunal emphasised it was professional misconduct uh, for an experienced conveyancing practitioner to fail to undertake some of the most basic and fundamental steps that all solicitors are legally and professionally obliged to complete. This was very serious professional misconduct. So again, that's really stark, isn't it? Uh, a co-ownership transaction where one party was defrauding another. Key point that we've mentioned in the past, there's no such thing as a collective client. Co-ownership, we've got to be very careful that we're getting instructions from all co-owners and giving advice to all co-owners to boot. Um, and then finally, I've mentioned in the notes this case of Harding Homes East Street and Bertram Dyson Bell, which is a 2016 case, uh, where Mrs Justice Proudman was very critical of a conveyancer. Uh, the conveyancer, the solicitor for the firm, cut corners all the time, sloppy in dating documents, didn't take full notes of meetings highlighting the point that I've made to you, I've preached to you in fact, the idea of doing the simple things well. So why are conveyances targeted for fraud? Because we're an easy target, because we can legitimise uh, ill-gotten gains with regard to money, and because, to be brutally honest, in the past our systems, checks and processes have not been good enough. Um, a matter that I was involved with a negligence claim a number of years ago now involving a sole practitioner in Lancashire. Uh, and the sole practitioner actually knew and was a very respected and very good conveyancer, to be honest with you, but got caught out in a very serious fraud uh, due to the conduct of an estate agent friend of his, who in essence asked him to act on a sale at a significant undervalue. And the estate agent went to his conveyancing friend and said, I'd like you to act for me on, in connection with the sale, uh, per, sorry, a purchase of a property from one of my clients. I'm buying it really cheaply. It's an absolute steal. Will you act for me? Uh, solicitor conveyancer said, yes, quite happy to act. Question, there isn't anything dodgy about this transaction, isn't there? There isn't anything I need to know, question number two. Estate agent said, no, absolutely nothing to worry about. In fact, the estate agent was buying the property from a drug dealer. The estate agent knew that his client was a drug dealer and also knew that he was subject to a proceeds of crime investigation and was dissipating assets as quickly and as swiftly as possible. And that the sale to the estate agent was one of the transactions that involved dissipation of assets. So drug dealer obviously knows what he's up to. Estate agent clearly knows what he's up to. Our conveyancer solicitor friend isn't aware of it and has asked two questions and has a, have had a satisfactory response from the estate agent client. Charged the client the princely sum of £200 on the basis of he was a pal and after the transaction 
the whole world falls apart, doesn't it? And our solicitor conveyancer friend finds himself subject to criminal sanction, uh, was sentenced to two years in prison by the Crown Court. Our estate agent colleague, we won't call him a friend, he gets sent to prison for a year and the drug dealer gets an extra year on his sentence. So our, our uh, solicitor conveyancer gets double the sentence that the other two get. Takes the matter to the Court of Appeal, appealing against sentence. Court of Appeal said, you are a doorkeeper of financial probity. You are there to prevent fraudsters from utilizing the conveyancing process for criminal activity. You're lucky that you got two years. You should have got more. So that's really a salutary lesson as to what we are required to do with regard to the conveyancing process. So it's pretty horrible, to be honest with you, and pretty scary to be, hor uh, to be brutal as well. So property fraud can lead to a risk of negligence claims. It can lead to professional misconduct issues, and it can lead to client complaints quite clearly. The main subject that I want to talk about is identity fraud. But before I do that, I mention in the notes some issues with regard to fraud and rectification. And the idea that where a client has been subject to fraud, the Land Registry or the Land Registration Act 2002 has a mechanism for remedying the position. And what I've done here is examine Schedule 4 of the Land Registration Act 2002 that permits alteration of the, reg of the register and highlighting the fact that where an innocent uh, registered proprietor loses their property or apparently loses their property due to seller identity fraud and the property is acquired by an innocent buyer, then the position normally is that the registered proprietor retains their title. So where the title is altered as a consequence of a fraudulent transfer, the starting point seems to be that the land registry are prepared to alter the register to resurrect the paper title owner's ownership. That assumes two things. One, that the registered proprietor has behaved reasonably with regard to their title ownership. And that hinges on the fact that they've kept their addresses for service at the land registry up to date and haven't done anything that would assist or perpetuate the potential fraud committed against them. So important to understand that. As far as application for rectification is concerned, it is enabled to correct mistakes, to bring the register up to date, and to give effect to any estate right of it or interest accepted from the effect of registration. So the land registry have very wide powers relating to rectification, the same powers that a high court judge would have. Important to understand that rectification can be made by a number of potential parties. But in this particular case, where a registered proprietor has been subject to fraud, it would be he or she that would be making the application. As far as rectification and fraudulent transfer is concerned, I've referred to a number of cases which you can have a look at. Mallory Enterprises being one, Fitzwilliam and Ritual Holdings being another, uh, all of which confirm that, in essence, the original paper title owner retains their title the innocent buyer potentially has a claim for indemnity against the land registry. There is an argument that I mentioned in the notes about Section 29 of the Land Registration Act and what is a registrable disposition and what is the position with regard to whether a fraudulent transfer constitutes a um, registrable disposition. Um, the court seemed quite clear as to the position original title owner as long as he behaved reasonably retains the title innocent buyer is entitled to compensation there is academic debate that that might not necessarily be right courtesy of section 29 i've given you the notes a case of pattern against todd which confirms that if there has been a situation where title has been lost the right to rectification is available and the period of time in which the period for rectification can be sought is six years. If the fraud relates to a deed, it can be 12 years. And it may be possible for 
an application to be approved of outside of those periods in exceptional circumstances. Uh, there's quite a little case law touching on all of those issues. You can have a look at them if you wish. Um, do be aware that there is an obligation on the registered proprietor and his or her conveyances to exercise reasonable care with regard to the registration process and with, with regard to title ownership. I mentioned in the notes uh, Practice Guide 39, which was originally published in October 2012 which highlights that if a solicitor engaged in an application for first registration misled the land registry by failing to submit all documents in possession, which then cause a mistake or an error made by the land registry, this could constitute a lack of proper care so that rectification may potentially take place against a registered proprietor in possession. So it just highlights the fact that there is a requirement to exercise care with regard to the registered proprietor and those advising them. Before I leave the issue of rectification and talk about indemnity just briefly, do watch applications for first registration to the land registry where clients have lost title deeds. In the good old days when I started dealing with conveyancing, if title deeds had been lost, the land registry were fairly relaxed and you could submit copy documents, submit um, statement of truth or stat deck explaining what had happened and why they'd been lost or where we thought they'd been lost, etc. And the land registry would be pretty relaxed. These days they're not relaxed at all with regard to that. It may be very difficult, if not impossible, to get any form of title at all. If you do get a title, it might be a possessory title. The land registry are particularly jumpy where title deeds have been lost by a client and where the client is not in fact in occupation of the property. I mentioned land registry and indemnity claims. Again, during this sort of high point of property seller identity fraud, 2015-2016, over 40% of indemnity claims related to property fraud. And the land registry has taken a number of steps to mitigate their exposure relating to fraud, but nonetheless, indemnity still is available relating to fraud. So it's possible to bring a claim for indemnity under the Land Registration Act 2002 if losses suffered as a result of rectification of the register, mistakes in the search, mistakes whose correction would involve rectification of the register, etc., etc. But these are land registry mistakes. Where a mistake is made by the land registry as a consequence of the neglect or a failure to behave reasonably on behalf of a third party, then the red land registry is entitled to pursue a claim against such a party and or may refuse to indemnify where a claim could be made against someone else. And therefore, you do need to be careful about indemnity claims being made to the land registry. The Limitation Act specifies the limitation periods for indemnity claims. The Land Registration Amendment Rules 2008 reduced the amount of in interest paid on indemnity claims. And before I leave indemnity, there's a very important point to make, and that is this. Whenever you are thinking about making an indemnity claim to the Land Registry, be alive to this very important point. The Land Registry will indemnify your client for the loss they sustained at the time that the mistake the Land Registry made which could be going back sort of six years or so, could be going 12 years if the mistake related to a deed. And therefore, the assessment of loss will be at that point. If you made a claim for indemnity with a claim for rectification of the title and the title is rectified, the value of the indemnity is assessed at the date of rectification. And therefore, all things being equal in a rising property market, your client will be entitled to more by way of indemnity where the loss is subject to rectification and the title is rectified as opposed to a simple and isolated indemnity claim. If you do make indemnity claims to the Land Registry, one or two practical points. The Land Registry have a very good record where they stick their heels in and say we're not paying out of being successful if matters are litigated very high proportion of success where they uh, defend claims. But it's wrong to think that they will be automatically defensive. 
the land registry can be very receptive to indemnity claims and very helpful and will meet the level the indemnity as well as meeting legal costs as well uh, Robert, in the past you have mentioned to me the fact that uh, rather than looking at sort of a rectification claim uh, to the land registry, there are sort of title policies that are available that might assist or might mean that sort of investigating the defect or investigating the problem might not be necessary and it might be a, a, a possible to take out a policy in place or instead of. Uh, have you any sort of comment to make or can you just remind me about what sort of products might fit to this sort of situational scenario? Yes, well, I mean, obviously you could look to um, effectively improve the title where there is mm -hmm. a defect in there. Um, mm -hmm. That could be looked at there generally, whatever the defect is. The, the main product we have, as, as Stephen mentioned at the start, really deals with uh, seller impersonation or yeah. duress, which is yeah. probably not quite what you're talking about here. Mm -hmm. because Obviously, yeah. that's discovered much more quickly. Yeah, yeah. The, I was just uh, all I was doing was just thinking to say, well, you know, rather than going through the, the pro if a title is defective and it may or may not be fraud related, it may be worth thinking about well, rather than going down that route from from a conveyancing perspective and from a transactional perspective, it might be better to think about a title indemnity policy and to move on rather than investigate and get embroiled in what can be quite lengthy and quite complex issues relating to rectification of title or indemnity. On the other yeah, hand... No, I think that's right. It's yeah. certainly got to be an option uh, to discuss with your client because it may well be a speedier one and yeah. give them the same protection that they need. As you say, um, particularly as regards sort of values of properties and so on, it may actually yeah. be much the better one for them. Yeah. Thanks for that, Robert. Um, finally, with regard to land registration, I talked about the Law Commission consultation paper relating to uh, land registration. Uh, electronic conveyancing is with us in all but name, in, in, in all but the sort of practicalities of it, as I've mentioned to you before. Uh, there is an issue, a real concern about fraud related issues relating to electronic conveyancing. Um, and the Law Commission have looked at that and also looked at lots of things uh, to do with shifting the responsibility relating to exposure to property fraud from the land registry to the legal profession. And I mean, that's been a sort of common theme with regard to the land registry over the last oh, 10, 11 years, but particularly the last five or six years. The idea of the early completion procedure, the idea of sort of verification of client ID the idea of the imposition of a double L restriction to protect or prevent identity fraud is all shifting responsibility from the land registry to us. And again, as we'll talk about when we talk about identity fraud, the idea that we have professional indemnity policies that are nice and juicy and can be relied upon to meet claims rather than the poor land registry's indemnity fund and battled indemnity fund as the land registry would see it. You notice the hint of uh, negativity with regard to land registry today. I promised I wouldn't be negative, but uh, I had an interesting conversation with the land registry yesterday that sort of uh, resulted in my sort of view once again that uh, there are certain land registry officers who've never read the appropriate land registry practice guide and are sort of spouting forth about an issue that uh, is clearly wrong when you've got a practice guide sitting in front of you. I digress. Identity fraud, horror stories. There are a number of horror stories relating to identity fraud. Either firms being uh, subject to identity fraud and fee owners, partners, etc., being impersonated, and of course, seller identity fraud, the big issue. As Robert mentioned, um, Stuart Title have a product which, to be honest, I've been sort of talking about for a number of years now since the product was introduced on the basis that I think if you have a buyer client who is risk averse or you have any suspicions or doubts with regard to seller identity, the policy is cheap. Robert, just remind me what the, the, the premium is for that. On a, or Steve mentioned it, didn't he? Um, with regard That's to right, yes. It, it, start, it starts from sort of uh, the low £20 for up to a quarter of a million pounds worth of yeah. cover. And even um, when you get to a million pounds worth of cover, which is a maximum we can go to, uh, you're looking at 67 pounds, 20 pence. Um, yeah. 
so it is very cheap uh, in, yeah. in that sense. And yeah. um, as you say, with a risk adverse client, it's got to be recommended to them because yeah. whilst no, no buyer in any transaction wants to spend any more money than they need to, here we're looking at total wipeout. Um, yeah. It's not just a, a diminution in value like most policies. Here, yeah. you know, all of your money, all of the proceeds of sale of your previous house, your savings, and the lender's money disappear. So yeah. it can be, it's truly horrific damage can be caused. Yeah. Have, have, have any firms sort of looked at this policy and thought, well, hang on a minute, we'll take it out on the basis that we've got some vulnerability? So we'll yes, I mean, yeah, one of the things we've done with this policy to, and um, no, no, we'll be talking about the Michigan case later, yeah. but yeah. this arose from that, is that it did both the original and the appeal put buyers solicitors in a really invidious position of being mm -hmm. responsible for the bad money laundering of their uh, the sellers solicitors yeah. and put yeah. the liability on them so yeah. uh, this policy is intended to cover that and one of the things we've done in it um, unlike a number of the standard policies is we yeah. have waived the right of subrogation against the right. buyers lawyers yeah um, so it is it is can generally be protection for them and uh, I mean, some firms offer it on every transaction uh, some recommend it on every transaction and you're right there are some who are actually defraying the cost themselves yeah um, I guess with the idea that it's much better to take a hit on this policy uh, than to have to go into your PI um, yeah. and also not just protecting the firm but from the uh, buyer's point of view or the lenders um, if you go under the professional indemnity policy you need to prove negligence here yeah. you just need to show the loss so exactly. it's a much simpler yeah. process. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for that, Robert. Good. So yeah, horror stories. It is amazingly simple for a fraudster to impersonate a seller of registered land. Um, one, we've got an open register. Two, we've got social media, etc., that mean there is access to personal information, albeit uh, not willingly provided, but just by uh, it's sitting there on Facebook and other platforms. It's a, it's possible for a fraudster to extract lots and lots of information that can assist them with regard to impersonation. So, horror stories. I've seen duplicate passports that uh, are apparently original passports. The printing, the copying, the forgery has been absolutely perfect. I've seen utility bills, bank statements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you look at the sort of the the document and it appears to be genuine and it would take a great deal of sort of forensic investigation to prove otherwise and as a sort of uh, transactional property lawyer have i got the time or the indeed the inclination to sort of justify uh, investigating uh, the source of the documentation and under undertaking checks etc to verify its uh, honesty and integrity. So, lots and lots of horror stories I'm sure you have heard of. Um, a number of things, really. First of all, vigilance throughout the transaction. A lot of fee owners think about client identity, seller identity fraud at the beginning of the transaction and then forget about it. That has to be wrong. And as Robert mentioned, Dream Bar and Mishkondorea, and the case that I mentioned as the starting point in my notes, Perrin Singh against the court and company 2016, both of these cases highlight, as do others, the need to be constantly aware throughout the transaction of who you are dealing with. So let's just have a look at it. In Perrin Singh, the seller's conveyancer was liable to the buyer's, uh, the buyer client for loss as a consequence of a not ensuring the seller's contact details generated some uh, connection with the seller's address for service at the land registry. The property was vacant and encumbered. The seller didn't have awareness about works that had been done to the property that the buyer was asking about. The seller was unable to verify where he worked. Uh, a previous buyer had asked for verification and the seller decided not to sell that buyer when inquiry was requested relating to his location at work. 
and the seller wanted a quick sale for a high value flat. So again, we've got liability there and the buyer's conveyance was liable, as I mentioned in the notes, because they wanted a, the client wanted a quick exchange and completion. Uh, the firm had copied correspondence from client to seller's conveyancer without permission from the client, so it was an, it was an, uh, an issue with regard to confidentiality. And this, uh, this is the interesting thing that I want to focus in on. The buyer's conveyancer was liable in currency because it raised an additional inquiry as to whether the conveyancer for the seller was familiar with the sellers and to check ID and to support the verification or checking of that ID. And that additional inquiry was unanswered. So what can we extract from that? Well, one, a point I've made to you all the time, if you're acting for a seller, can you confirm the seller's contact details are verified by the contact details they've given the land registry? There's a connection between address for service and the contact details the client has given you. Secondly, with regard to ID, throughout the transaction, are you constantly checking that the client is providing you with information that is accurate? Is there anything that's suspicious with regard to information that is provided? So, for example, the TA forms that the seller completes, a lot of the questions are answered and the answers are incorrect. Well, all right, we might be able to forgive an innocent seller for one or two errors, but not for lots of errors. Or where an inquiry or question is posed by the buyer's conveyancer and the seller's conveyancer doesn't know or can't provide a correct answer. Again, that's the obvious thing, isn't it? There are some less obvious uh, issues that I think we need to be aware of. What about this? Um, a client who is constantly changing mobile telephone numbers or email addresses, or isn't ans doesn't answer the mobile phone and the, the connection with the first call, but also returns the call back. A client that is evasive, a client that um, is sort of uh, very relaxed about situations where a client ought not to be relaxed. These, again, are potentially suspicious that might generate liability for a seller's conveyancer or indeed a buyer's conveyancer. With regard to sources of information, there are to, sort of two schools of thought currently, and this is quite interesting. There are some firms that will traditionally stick for physical evidence of ID, passports, utility bills, etc., being produced to the office, being photocopied and put on file. Well, with regard to that, one, it is important not to give the document a simple cursory examination, but to study it. Two, to record on file that you've checked the information that has been produced against other information that you've got. If the passport is new, if a driving license is new, then can we see the old documents that they have replaced? It isn't enough just simply to photo photocopy documents and put them on the file and then leave it. There should be some form of check being made with regard to the information that's disclosed and evidence on file that there's been that check. With regard to the use of sort of electronic means of uh, uh, verification, uh, the idea of sort of um, what, what have we seen, sort of the client Skyping with a copy of the passport being shown during that event uh, with some form of electronic verification systems. There, are, there is software out there, there are firms sort of generating uh, product that can be utilized to verify ID. Well, fine, utilize that, but then have some other form of check to boot. So, all well and good having the client sort of Skyping you and revealing their passport, etc., but then asking for some other information. Um, other sources of information how many firms will actually Google a new client? Who are they? What do they do? Uh, what about looking at LinkedIn? So a client says that he works for, uh, I don't know, uh, Oxfordshire County Council. Let's Google him or her and see, or let's go on LinkedIn to see if that's the case. Uh, why has the client come to your firm? Would you always ask that question? The client may have come to your firm because they've dealt with you in the past. You could verify that. They may have come to you because they live locally. Of course, with the amount of business that's done via the internet, et cetera, there may be a client that's... Um, come to you via uh, an inquiry that is sort of internet based well fine again that's okay as long as you know why the client has come to you 
important that throughout the transaction you are constantly aware of the potential for risk. Um, I mentioned in the past that if you're acting for a buyer, asking a seller's conveyancer to give additional warranties as to checks or investigations relating to uh, seller client ID is potentially dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because a seller's conveyancer shouldn't give additional warranties or confirmation as to verification of ID other than to confirm they've done the appropriate AML checks. So the moment you've asked the question of the seller's conveyancer, please confirm that the seller is the registered proprietor of the title at its most basic, alarm bells will ring because you've raised it as an issue and you haven't had a satisfactory response. Well, like that point I mentioned in currency, the buyer's conveyancer was on the hook for liability because they raised a question about seller's identity that was uh, unsatisfactorily answered. And therefore, the judge emphasized that the firm for the buyer had clearly highlighted seller identity was an issue, but hadn't sort of had any form of satisfactory response. Uh, on that point, uh, I mentioned to you in the past, the Property Litigation Association website is a brilliant paper written by a barrister called Nick Taggart, called Who You Think You're Kidding. It's well worth looking at. It sort of highlights a number of the points that I've just made there and makes some more. So what else can we say? about identity fraud well in the notes i've given you lots of other cases involving impersonation and uh, identity fraud uh p p property limited against owen white and others 2016 case quite interesting uh in this case the court sort of emphasized that estate agents are required to carry out anti-money laundering checks in connection with their clients but that doesn't mean that we can rely on those checks. Uh, Winkworth, in this case, weren't, who were the relevant estate agents, weren't held to be liable for breach of warranty authority. Um, the question of who has the legal title, who is the registered proprietor, said the court, is a matter for solicitors and not estate agents. So the same level of responsibility that we have, this idea of being a doorkeeper relating to financial probity, doesn't relate to other professionals such as estate agents, which is a little bit unfair in my view. Um, I've given you Santander against RA Legal Solicitors, Davison Solicitors against Nationwide Building Society, um, and all of these cases sort of highlight the fact that a solicitor is required to behave reasonably, and if they fail to do so, and a lender or someone else sustains loss, then there is the potential for liability. Robert mentioned a little earlier, Mishkon Derea and uh, Dreambar. And again, that case makes fairly startling reading, doesn't it, when you look at it in the Court of Appeals attitude. Um, in essence, uh, Mishkon Derea did next to nothing wrong as far as the conveyancing process was concerned, other than having a very healthy professional indemnity policy that meant that in connection with the spread of risk, it was right that their client did not sustain loss and that the insurance policy paid out on the loss that the buyer client sustained. So as far as identity fraud is concerned, a number of points. One, make sure that when you're getting information, it's generated from two sources at least. So if you're, in, if you're willing to risk the use of sort of some form of virtual identification, have some form of secondary check sitting there alongside it. Make sure that if you're using physical documentation, you don't just give it a cursory examination and copy it and put it on file. Show that you've done something with the information and done something more than a cursory check. And just be vigilant throughout the transaction. I mentioned to firms fairly regularly that you know, all the time you'll be seeing client signatures on documentation. Check those signatures. Make sure that the signatures are constant. Make sure if a client is ringing you, that he's ringing you on the same mobile number. If a client's changing email address, then you know, ask them why. There may be a perfectly logical reason. On the other hand, it may be that they're constantly changing email and mobile telephone numbers on the basis that they're involved in things where they don't want to be sourced or identified. I mentioned the impersonation of law firms, and I've touched on this already. Again, the important point here, I think, is the point that I mentioned a little earlier, 
the idea of having duality of information. So I've gone on the SRA website and looked at the law firm and confirmed their existence and checked their relevant SRA member, et cetera, et cetera. Check that the fee owner that I'm dealing with is who they say they are. But of course, the SRA register is not conclusive and therefore we should be checking or undertaking additional checks. We could use lawyer check, we could use some other form of uh, uh, electronic system, or there may be other methods. We could bring up a local law society. Do you know this firm? Do you know this particular firma? We could bring the firm's head office. Um, and some firms I know will insist that a firm provides them, if they're exchanging emails, with a copy of the firm's letter heading, so there is at least one hard copy piece of correspondence on file for the conveyancer for the other side to sort of verify the other firm's existence. I understand that. I wouldn't say it is essential, but I do get why you might want to uh, approach the matter on that basis. Other things that you can do with regard to checking, again, just looking at the firm's website and seeing if they have branch offices. Um, watch if firms are sending you emails and again in one of my conclusions i mentioned the fact that lockdown is potentially a fraudster's charter the idea of fearners working from home has the potential for you to receive an email from a an email address that isn't the firm's well again you could see how that would lead to an opportunity potentially for fraud um there is a requirement with regard to the impersonation of law firms, again, to be constantly vigilant throughout the transaction, not just checking at the start and leaving it at that. So there may be unusual occurrences relating to the transaction that would warrant uh, checking or warrant some form of sitting back and just having a long, hard think about things. On that point, uh, what I always say to fear is no matter who you are, what you are, what your experience is, or what your lack of experience is, if you're suspicious about something, if something doesn't pass the sniff test, then talk to someone, talk to your compliance team, and talk to a colleague and say, hey, just have a look at that, or I'm just going to tell you something, I'm not going to tell you what I think, you tell me what you think. And then often, you know, your suspicions can be confirmed, or it may be possible with another pair of eyes looking at the issue or the problem for uh, an idea to be suggested to try and uh, clarify the position and to generate some certainty for you. As far as land registration is concerned, what have we got? Well, we've got the property alert scheme uh, enabling the registered propriety or clients to be notified of sus suspicious activity. Do you advise clients about that? Uh, you know, in the conclusion of a transaction, will you report to the client the fact that there is this facility available for them? Uh, it is possible to register to 10 properties in England and Wales using the property alert scheme. Do you give or have you given the clients a copy of the land registry guidance with regard to fraud and the risk of fraud? That used to be contained in Public Guide 17, now available on the land registry website. <coughs> have you spoken to clients about the use of restrictions? RQ company for company restrictions. Uh, you can only plus a maximum of three such restrictions on titles on behalf of limited companies. Restrictions by an owner not living at the property, the RQ restriction, which I've given you detail of, and the double O restriction. There is an element of pushback with regard to the use of re restrictions by firms on the basis that firms will say, well, hang on a minute, I'm putting my neck on the line in verifying client ID for the purposes of the restriction, because all of these restrictions require a certificate to be provided by a conveyancer that the person dealing with the land is in fact the registered proprietor. Um, remember that certificates signed in connection with these restrictions by a member of staff in the name of the firm are not adequate and sufficient. There must be a personal certification by a conveyancer. Um, it is important to understand that chartered legal executives, Silex conveyancing practitioners, uh, can provide certificates as can solicitors. But you can't have a sort of a fear and a paralegal or support member of support staff signing such a certificate. Um, 
I've given you details relating to all of those restrictions in the notes. I've mentioned the land registry guidance and assistance relating to public guide 17 and mentioned that the land registry are keen to emphasize voluntary registration of unregistered land, clients keeping addresses for service up to date. And remember, the client can have three addresses for service. Um, also, the idea that of inviting clients to sign up for the land registry's property alert service. I want to conclude today by just highlighting some statements made by the HM Land Registry's Deputy Chief Executive, which was reported in today's conveyancer. The idea of personal identification in the current climate, as, as is stated, inconvenient and difficult, and that there are technological means of checking and verifying client ID, the government gateway system being the obvious example, uh, which again, if you haven't seen, have a look at the Land Registry's information concerning digital mortgages. And we've got the Law Society press precedent saying that uh, biometric checking, etc., could help the verification of client identity. Could help, not will help. So there's a degree of uncertainty relating to product, which again leads me to conclude that I think it is dangerous to rely on electronic or uh, other methods of verification apart from physical verification, that there needs to be some form of backup or some form of safety system just in case at a later date uh, the idea of cryptographic or biometric checking is, is challenged or tested by the courts and has proved to be unsatisfactory. Remember that all is expected of you is to do that which a reasonable conveyancer would do. You're not a detective. You're not part of MI5 or MI6, I guess, and therefore there is a limit to what you can do. I think you heighten awareness to clients. I think you are constantly aware of problems or issues. Be aware of the sort of cumulative effect of matters during the life of the transaction, each one not sort of sufficient to sort of uh, set alarm bells ringing, but five or six different innocent uh, incidents meaning that alarm bells definitely do start ringing loud and clear understand that Perencing and dreamvar make sure that you are aware of two issues one there are certain types of transaction that generate greater potential vulnerability to fraud and secondly, the need to make sure that you are constantly checking, cross-checking information that transpires throughout the transaction. Again, you can't simply, on opening a file, deal with client ID and think that's the end of the matter. Further, with regard to communication with clients using emails, et cetera, et cetera, I haven't spoken to you about the sort of Friday afternoon fraud the idea of getting an email from your uh, chief exec, from your accounts department or senior partner, saying that your account has been hacked and therefore you've now got to let everyone know that your bank account details have changed for today and here are the new details, let everybody know. Again, not a common occurrence, but it has occurred with regard to firms. Uh, again, showing the sophistication of fraudsters and the availability to intercept emails and send emails on in internal systems that appear to be from senior partner, chief exec, head of accounts, etc., leading you to immediately react and not challenge or test the information. Uh, again, you know, fraudsters uh, are sophisticated as far as IT is concerned, they can be very sophisticated. And the thing that worries me is that they're probably ahead of the game. So no matter what we're doing, no matter what we're talking about today, there will be some thoughts that are sitting out there coming up with some form of amazing scheme that enables him or her to intercept, intercept our emails without our knowing about it, or create some other form of fraud that we only get to hear about when we look in the Law, Law Society Gazette or today's conveyancer, or we look in the newspapers as to what's happened or what's uh, going off. It is gone 12 o'clock. 
and I'm conscious that there may be some questions, Stephen, and I'm also conscious of everyone's time, and therefore I'm going to finish, if I can, with the last slide. What's the next big problem? We don't know. Lockdown has generated opportunities for fraud. We're working from home, we're more relaxed, we're in a world where we're told there should be more goodwill, that we should be assisting in the conveyancing process to get deals done, etc. There is a need for constant awareness, there is the need for question and challenge, and there is the need to be aware of problem transactions. When we're dealing with international companies, when we're dealing with clients that we haven't dealt with before, dealing with clients in connection with transactions where the, the property concerned is a vulnerable property. Stephen, I've said enough for one day, so I'm going to stop and see what questions we've got. And I think you've got some polls as well, haven't you? Uh, that's correct. Yes, thank you so much, you. Um, yeah, fantastic presentation. And I think um, it, it seems logical to me as well. I mean, I'm maybe more of a layman on, on, on this subject, but uh, during lockdown, working more virtually, I think that there is definitely a heightened danger of, uh, and then as you say, more sophisticated. Um, fraudsters coming to the market at this time yeah. um you know just i'll start off with the the polls I'll, I'll get those running and then we do have a couple of questions um both to thank you. you and also to, to robert as well so i'll pass them to robert um so we have three polls to run i'll just try and run these um very quickly they're all focused on uh the the running of these webinars going forward and and so, so your feedback would be very uh, valuable so the the first question that we're asking is as the market starts to pick up would you still be interested uh, and available to attend these sessions? And the, the answers really, they're, they're more a sort of time-based answer. So it's every week, every two weeks, once a month, by recording only, or will likely be too busy. So we'll just let that um, run for a minute there. Um, Ian, while that's running, we've had a question from Alistair, and he said, what guidance can you give clients that are living abroad? Right, well, great question. With regard to clients that are living abroad who are registered proprietors, the client can have an address for service out of jurisdiction. It is also possible for the client to uh, sign up to the property alert service and also to um, use an email address as an address for service at the land registry. So there I'm thinking about the advising a seller client or a buyer client who just purchased the property. If we're talking about acting for a buyer where the seller is resident abroad, then what we've got to do is we've got to have a think about what we can do to verify ID. And if I was going to in, embark on some form of electronic verification, I would want some form of paper trail as well. So if the client is, if I'm comfortable with the client Skyping me, presenting their passport or other ID to me via Skype, I'd want them also to scan documentation and send it to me and potentially have some form of secondary check on the client. So like in the parenting case, the seller, the fraudster said he worked at a hospital in Abu Dhabi. I would be asking the client for the, his work's contact number, landline, and I would be checking it. I'd also be checking, for example, LinkedIn, to see if that hospital at Abu Dhabi had a person working there that was the person reporting to be my client. So Alistair raises a problem. I think, again, I go back to my sort of golden rule. Instead of just having one method of verification relating to client ID, I'd want two, and perhaps even three, if I was sort of extremely suspicious about why a client restricted me. I've never heard of, from them before. And... Uh, there was anything else that uh, sort of sent alarm bells ringing upon receipt of first in, uh, instruction. So to answer Alistair's question, um, if I'm acting for a buyer and they're resident abroad and we're wanting to protect them from fraud, the address for service point is the key point and the property alert service is the other key point. You could also use an RQ restriction, as I mentioned in the notes. If I'm acting for a buyer and the seller is resident abroad, then uh, I'm relying on the seller and I'm probably going to bring in you, Stephen, or you, Robert, and taking out one of your policies uh, on the basis there's the potential for vulnerability. If I'm acting for the seller and my client is abroad, I'm going to do 
uh, some additional checks just to verify ID. Lovely, good question. Thanks for that, Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Ian. That's very useful. I'll just I'll run the second poll for asking a couple more questions. So yeah. the the second poll is uh, what would be your preferred time? Uh, for these sessions going forward. So they're currently at 11 a.m. That is one of the options. I'll put the other options up now and just give a moment to answer that. Um, Megan uh, asks, is man safer if I'm registered? Too much effort to find out details or forge deeds? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, there is a school of thought that says, yeah, unregistered land is safer because proof of ownership is the retention of deeds. The problem with that, of course, Stephen, is the fact that it's e relatively easy to forge deeds and documents. Um, I think, you know, the old school land or child certificate is potentially the, the, the best way of dealing with things on the basis that there was a document. It might be possible to have some form of biometric facility within that document that makes it difficult, if not impossible, to... Uh, um forge uh, but yeah you know the, the old system has its advantages having said that there are significant advantages from a conveyancing perspective of the land register in particular the sort of state guarantee in particular the availability of downloading documentation and whilst the public register is to an extent a fraudster's charter it also is useful for conveyances on the basis that it makes the conveyancing process quicker. Interesting um, stat with regard to timings there, uh, Stephen. I'm just looking at that. Yes, yeah, I, I, I'm slightly surprised myself. I thought there might be yeah. um, a few more around the, the lunchtime or before 9 a.m., but I think the certainly the 11 o'clock slot is, is working very well for us, I think, Ian. But, uh, um, yeah. Uh, that's interesting feedback and a nice split and uh, I think one thing we are potentially looking at going forward is maybe being a bit more nuanced with the, the presentations and uh, uh, sort of maybe splitting them out slightly so that's that's an area we can also sort of look yeah. at I think. We've spoken about that Stephen, I'm very interested in whether or not you know rather than providing these sort of webinars of, which, are, which I hope are of general interest uh, looking at whether or not we could sort of target and I've spoken to you in the past about targeting webinars and saying let's do some for property support lawyers or let's do them for sort of paralegals uh, trainees and those relatively new to conveyancing and looking at that mix i'm happy and delighted to be honest with you to do these ones which i'm pitching at a sort of general level but i'm perfectly happy to look at along with yourself and robert sort of looking at specific areas for specific types of lawyer or conveyancer so i'm open to that but uh, you know, my, my philosophy is that if these are these events are popular and uh, you know people want to listen, then I'm quite happy to assist and to provide uh, what I think are webinars of sort of general interest. But that that timing point is really interesting. I thought people would be interested early morning or sort of late afternoon. Um, perhaps it's an indicator of sort of work levels. Perhaps, you, you know, given the fact that the number of firms were still on furlough, et cetera, and that the, the amount of work might not be the same as usual, that sort of 11 o'clock or sort of mid-morning is sort of a good time. So that's interesting, really interesting. Thanks for yeah. that, Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to come to roll with a couple of uh, product-related questions yeah. now. And before that, I'm just going to launch the final poll. So the, the question is that the series is mainly focused on residential property. Uh, would people be interested in more webinars focused on commercial issues going forward? So I'll just launch that poll now, a simple yes or no answer there. Um, Robert, hopefully you're still on the line. So we've had a couple of questions from uh, Mark. So uh, Mark asks, would we be at liberty to, on all, purchase, on all purchase with mortgage matters, include a premium for fraud stroke identity policy on the basis that we insist on such a policy? Uh, with mortgage transactions so mandating the policy there i think um and uh would they be uh obliged to include the premium for that um yeah i suppose it really depends upon what you're you're saying to the client uh whether you're saying to the client you must have this or we really recommend it in those cases 
Um, there are the general requirements, obviously, under the Insurance Act uh, and FCA requirements, which lawyers do need to follow uh, because you are uh, defined by those as an insurance intermediary. So you need to uh, allow the client the choice to see if to explain why insurance might be useful. Uh, but I don't think you can say mandate that they take it out. Um, perhaps a way round it would be, well, obviously if the lender insisted upon it, and some lenders we deal with now, uh, some of the specialist ones are insisting upon it, uh, that this policy is taken out. So it really forms part of your mortgage offer there. And if you didn't want to take it out as a client, you'd need to find another lender. Um, but perhaps there is a, an argument for saying that you are taking out the policy to protect the firm. It has benefit to the client uh, as well. Uh, but I think there, the premium would need to come out of your fee. So if you normally charge, I don't know, £750 for the transaction, uh, your fee would still be 750 but you'd be paying uh, 26 pounds to us um i don't think you could have a situation where you'd normally charge 750 and suddenly you're charging 776 without the client's consent so uh you'd also need to think uh if you are forcing the client into it uh of your obligations regarding demands and needs statements uh and explain it to the client so there are probably ways to do it uh, but you would need to be open about what you were doing. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Uh, the follow-up to that is, is there an identity fraud policy when acting for the seller? One could be blameless, as in Mishcon, but a small firm like mine could be put out of business if having to make such a claim on an indemnity policy and not being able to get professional indemnity insurance for any insurer on renewal. Yeah, no, I think that it's, it's a good point. It's like Ian was stressing at the end, you know, we aren't spies, we aren't MI5, how far do we need to go? Um, the problem is that all insurance policies in this field tend to be not looking to cover uh, negligence or bad luck on the part of a lawyer, uh, which is probably more the bad luck case here. Um, so our policy doesn't cover that. Um, I'm not aware of one being on the market that does it. The issue would be really, how do you define what is good procedure for identification? Um, there are uh, suggestions in the UK Finance Handbook as what that would mean. And there are ones obviously circulated by the regulatory bodies. But I think it would conceivably be a field day for litigators uh, if a claim was made arguing whether you had done the uh the full due diligence you should do um and as the, the 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 danger areas are moving all the time as ian said that's quite difficult to prove um one way i think it, it could work um is that with our policies as i said earlier we waive the right of subrogation against the buyer's lawyer so we cannot pursue a claim against them um, there is an argument, and some sellers' lawyers have uh, taken comfort from this, that if we don't have a uh, right of subrogation against the buyer's lawyer, we don't have any standing to bring an action against the seller's lawyer either. Uh, that's not tested in any way, but that is, is one way of dealing with it, possibly. Yeah, no, thank you, Robert. Um, just trying to, to uh, wrap up a bit, uh, Ian, we have a, a couple of... Um, comments actually and, and a, a question as well so a couple of comments from uh, Zara who says uh, there's a website out there that will actually fake bank statements for people to be yeah. aware um, yeah. and uh, she also makes a point that she's uh, experienced a lot of difficulties herself getting letters from solicitors regarding the LL restrictions of the form LL um, yeah. and uh, but the, 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 a question as well from uh, Zara and she says do you have any guidance or could point me to any guidance to what I should be looking for when I receive passports and bank statements electronically through house spot areas? There isn't anything that I've seen on that, Stephen, unfortunately. Um, there isn't, I, I have certainly haven't seen any guidance relating to errors, no. Um, I have seen a situation where a forged passport had different reference numbers on it. But I haven't, you know, it wouldn't be necessary, in my view, to check each and every page of a passport to confirm that the reference numbers are all correct, etc. 
And I also have seen a situation where a forged passport had um, stamps of visits to countries that didn't, color, uh, uh, didn't correlate with the client's statements relating to when they'd been in the UK, I saw that. But there isn't any sort of generic ad advice relating to checking passports. All I suggest is that if you, you take a photocopy of the uh, page of the passport with a uh, photograph, address, reference number, and then just mark on the file, you've checked that against some other information or the client's been present and you've checked that the photograph appears to have a resemblance to the person in front of you. On the issue of obtaining a uh, bank statement, uh, of, of uh, obtaining information online, uh, there was at one stage a number of companies that were offering the facility of producing duplicate wage slips. Um, last time I looked, um, there was only one company doing that. But when I first started looking and talking about property for, uh, about seven years ago, eight years ago now, there were nine companies that were offering the facility for producing duplicate wage slips. How bad's that? So you, yeah. if, you, if you created a false ID, you could contact them and get wage slips to sort of verify who you were, which is pretty staggering, to be honest with you. Oh, yes. yes, indeed. Right. Thank you, Ian. Um, yeah. so one, one, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, one final question. Um, I'm wary of the time. Thank you so much, everyone that has uh stayed on um so the, the question from Manib uh Manib asks is it strictly necessary to obtain notarized proof of id and proof of address for overseas clients or is it sufficient to reply upon uh, rely upon wet signatures certification by a uk re regulated professional i.e a doctor a dentist accountant uh, yeah. would you deem a banking employee or a banking manager to certify their identification mm -hmm. I don't think employer or bank manager would be sufficient to certify. My stance has always been notary, but I'm doing some work on that at the moment, Stephen. So if the delegate would like to send me an email, I'll have a look at that and give them a sort of definitive answer as to what the position is. I'm just doing a little bit of research on that particular point at the moment. Uh, what I'll do is I'll share that with everyone, I think, next week, if I can, as well. Certainly, that would be very useful. I think yeah, we can certainly do the, the follow-up there as well, Ian, yeah. with, with me. Yeah. So thank you for that question, Maeve. Um, Final comment uh, from uh, Megan, Megan Jenkins, who says uh, more of us, with, with reference to the uh, and the timing of the webinars, says more of us take a proper lunch break now at home than in the office, uh, e.g. eating with family. Uh, I'm certainly, that resonates with me, I'm certainly someone that has a young family and uh, not having to commute in has, has uh, certainly allowed me to have a more right. proper break around yeah. 1 p.m. That's good. Um, absolutely, yeah. So, um, let's just say, Ian, thank you very much once again for the fantastic presentation again, and thank you to Robert for for your your, your comments. Um, and and more importantly, thank you to everyone else for, as I say, staying on and and, and listening to today's session. Um, we will, as per usual, be following up, so you will receive an email. Uh, we try to get them out tomorrow. It, it's all dependent, really, on. Uh, how quickly the, the recording is put together. But we will try and follow up with everyone tomorrow with a copy of the slides and the notes and also a recording of the webinar. But once again, thank you to everyone for attending today and we look forward to seeing you hopefully next week. So thank you, goodbye.